Okay, uh, welcome uh, again to the CMPS 2016 here in College Park, Maryland. And uh, I want to thank everybody who's been involved in making this a great success. Tonight we're going to be doing a tradition that was set up, I'm not sure how many years ago, but it's probably over 10 years now at least. And that is a tradition set up by the former MPA and we continue it with the CMPS, which is uh, the John Chappelle Memorial uh, uh, talk and obviously John Chappelle was the founder of what I call modern dissidents here in the United States and around the world because I believe they met in St. Petersburg uh, at times and uh, he was quite a an amazing man. Uh, I, I got to know him. I know Ron Hatch who is our uh, speaker tonight and also uh, receiving the award knew him and I've talked about him already but he was quite a cantankerous man. It was at the time when dissidents were real men. <laughs> That's the time when co <laughs> actually people threw coffee, scalding coffee on each other when they didn't agree. So there was no coffee, although we were getting a little tense once in a while, uh, but uh, it was nothing like those guys. And uh, But he was, again, what was remarkable, uh, I know today we had uh, a really great guest, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Alexander Unsiger. I hope you really enjoyed him. And uh, he, John Chappelle, if you do, if you can, go to our website, go to the videos, and, uh, or, and you'll find our video channel on YouTube. I have some videotapes I haven't actually digitized all of them. But one of them we do have is from John Chappelle, I think in 1994 or 93. A small little room somewhere and not many people, maybe six people, maybe less. And uh, he was there with these people going at it like, you know, there were a thousand people there. He didn't care because he was there for the debate. He was there to get people together. And uh, I really, like I said, I didn't get to really know him. I shared a room a couple nights from with him. <laughs> that, was a, that was a treat where he put the oranges on the, but he was, he, I obviously didn't have a lot of money and he didn't have a place to stay so I, I was in Flagstaff and I was 36 at the time. I said, you can stay. He says, hey, my roomie left. I don't have money for a place. And I mean, I just met them. It was the first time. The first time I met people in the MPA, I walked, it was in the University of Flagstaff and there was this very big, one of those auditoriums, those really steep ones in college. And I sat in the back and the first thing I'm hearing from this group is, and next we have a very, very interesting equation. That's what I'm hearing. I mean, it's not too bad, huh? That's, if you don't think that, that's the way she talks. And she's, she's literally standing up here, wrapped in this, she was really wrapped, and I couldn't figure out why. And I'm, I'm serious, I'm not lying. She's talking. And then once in a while, she's talking and she takes something like this and she sticks food into her. And I swear, the first thing I thought was, she has another head. <laughs> and she's, because she was talking really strange, she's got one of those people that has a head down there. And she, you know, and I hear, Mom! she just keep doing that. And it turned out she had a chihuahua she took everywhere. <laughs> But I swear, I'm, I'm not kidding, I'm not kidding, Ron. I sat in the back of that place, contemplating whether to leave. And if I think about it now, and all you yahoos, I should have left. But no, it was, it was quite amazing. And I figured, I, th I figured if I could get through that, I could get through it, get through it all. She's quite an amazing lady. Uh, I haven't seen her. I guess she's still doing pretty well. Uh, she's a vegetarian. Her, her family's all lived in the hundreds. Uh, but, you know, Ron Hatch, I know from that time, uh, and uh, other people who have since passed. And, and, and uh, one of the things that that's really important to us is to try to keep the traditions of these people alive and their, their memories. And to have Ron today you know, talk about <clears throat> something that he's been working on for many decades. I've, I've, I've known about Ron for quite a while. It's, it's a great honor. So I feel very good that 
this is a good decision for our, our uh, it was a really easy decision for our director to make to choose him to do this because it really is, is truly an honor because the people who not only gave the talk but have received the award are quite big people. Halt, 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 Halt and Arp was one of the people who received the, the award we're going to give tonight. It has a different name but it doesn't matter. There's nothing more important than in this group of really amazing people to be honored amongst those people. So what we're going to do today is uh, I'm going to introduce uh, he's doing double duty. <laughs> he's going to work until, you know, then you're retired. Uh, but uh, uh, Ron Hatch is um, an expert in GPS. Uh, he worked, uh, I guess, has, what, over 30 patents now, continues to have patents. It takes a while. I interviewed him in the movie, so if you haven't seen uh, the, the documentary um, Einstein Wrong, he was the first investor in it, too. I sent it to many film festivals, we got in, but I think what's going to be, it's going to be one of those films you're going to see as this group grows, because I continue to show it to people. And you know what the shocking thing is? I thought this was going to be, you know, Einstein, and this is a good film. And the nice thing about it is, is that we have people like Ron Hatch in it who talks, and other people, and then builds up a story. And it really makes, it's really important, in my opinion, to have the story behind the, the, the scientists and know who they are, where they've come from. Now, I don't have a lot about Ron Hash. All I know is he has 13 children. That's quite a lot. <laughs> One of them are here. In fact, no matter where we went in the country to have this banquet, he would have a child living locally. <laughs> once adopted. <laughs> once adopted. <laughs> That's still a child. So, But, uh, you know, I don't know, have a lot of history about him. But I do know, talking to his daughter, that he's an amazing person. He's always been very personable, very open, uh, and very opinionated, obviously, too. Uh, that's really great, and uh, we really uh, are proud to have him speak uh, with uh, us for this uh, memorial talk, which, like I said, if I look back at the people who did this, it's quite, a, quite an honor to have him do that. So I want to welcome our speaker for tonight, uh, Mr. Ron Hatch. The top button is the, uh, the laser pointer, and the bottom button is goes forward. And then the middle is... Ready, set, go? Yeah, go. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm indeed very honored to, uh, to be able to uh, make this presentation, and humbled a bit by it too especially in the light of uh, the prior recipients. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering a little bit, though, since I know a number of them have passed on, is this a sign of my... <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. You're too, you're too cantankerous. <laughs> this cord keeps getting tangled there. Okay. Um, I thought, especially in the light of uh, Unzecker's comment from uh, Isaac Isimov, you might appreciate this one from him. No physicist who is even marginally sane doubts the validity of special relativity. So I think you know where we are. <laughs> uh, I do believe that GPS reveals a lot of logical faults in GRT and SRT. Um, but I also, I'm tempted to spend quite a bit. I, I was wanting this to be very fast because I've got a lot of slides. But I'm tempted to stop here even on critical thinking because after listening to many of you this last several days, I can't imagine that there are any of you who spoke aren't going to be a little bit critical of some of the things I say. <laughs> uh, please uh, tailor that a little bit. Uh, uh, I, uh, I have been criticized rather severely, not only in my own criticism of people, but also in what I say. And uh, in fact, the first time I was criticized for for, uh, for being critical of others, uh, I was rather shocked and dismayed because uh, I do claim to be a Christian and there are quite a few things in the scripture about God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble and, and uh, look not on, on, on your own things only but on the things of others. And then immediately following that, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, etc. cetera. So, uh, so that disturbed me quite a bit that I was criticized for criticizing. And my only response at that time 
Uh, what, in fact, that person has become a very close friend of mine since then. But my only response at the time was he was asking me for criticism. I'm not sure I was aware of just how much he was passing that criticism on, though. So others saw my criticism in a little bit different light than he did. Uh, in any case, I have tried since then to be a little bit more careful. And uh, there's a verse that, you know, that does say, speak the truth in love. So I try to be a little bit kinder when I criticize, at least. Uh, how successful I am at that, I, I'm not sure. I do try not to criticize a, a person's paper unless they ask for it these days. So, so if you really want some criticism, I'm willing to give some. But, uh, but I don't offer it quite as freely as I used to. OK, let's go on. Uh, these, to me, are guiding principles. By the way, you'll notice down at the bottom, this particular, well, it says GPS 2. The original one said GPS 1. The Only the ones with that down at the bottom did I have I used before. I wanted to say that because I use a word there, trumps. That means <laughs> you might think I was, <laughs> I was uh, trying to get a little more attention than I did. Uh, but uh, you see what uh, I think are guiding principles uh, uh, right there. Logical problems. My kids grew up with me saying, you know, uh, today's Friday if it doesn't rain, and, uh, and uh, expecting, expecting a, a bit of reaction on that. Uh, at, the, at the church where I go, they, uh, the pastors will often start saying, if we haven't met before, my name is such and such. And I always want to go up to them afterwards and say, you know that's your name anyway. <laughs> and uh, this one, uh, my wife and I had her blood drawn quite often for a while. And, and their sign in the lobby said, no eating or no drinking. So I'd spend all that time there in the lobby saying, now, which shall I not do? <laughs> so you can see I have logic problems. Uh, this one is, is pretty good. I, I, I hope you don't see too many loose ends in my talk tonight. Uh, well, or maybe that you do see a bunch of loose ends. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> Dilbert saying, uh, and we know mass creates gravity because dense planets have more gravity. How do we know which planets are more dense? They have more gravity. That's circular reasoning. I prefer to think of it as having no loose ends. <laughs> OK. Let's go on to the next one. Maybe we'll get down to business here pretty soon. Uh, the first section of this, I'm going to talk about the equivalence principle, falling light, and GRT. Uh, I'm going to uh, the equivalence principle itself, the GPS evidence, and then what I call some incredible logic from some relativists. And uh, let's go right on in. Uh, the Einstein equivalence principle is described here. Fundamentally, it says uh, you can't tell the difference between acceleration and, and being in a gravity field, uniform gravity field. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of limited, though, when you get right down to it. They say uh, as long as you don't look outside the elevator, it, it, a few things along those lines. And it is indeed uh, the case that there are some uh, some equivalences, but really, the physics, I claim, is almost completely different. Here he is in 1921 re restating it again in the meaning of relativity. I say there's a severe limitation to that, uh, to the use of that, and it's way overused uh, in, in, in many papers, and uh, I've fought against it quite a bit. Uh, for example, gravitational potential, if you take the clock to a higher elevation and leave it there a little while, it, it, uh, it runs faster. So you gain time. Uh, so you know that, uh, in fact, uh, something is different. Uh, in GPS, uh, uh, it turns out that uh, we know that uh, the clock runs faster at higher altitude. Uh, but uh, it is true, under self-imposed restrictions, acceleration and gravitational potential can appear the same, especially if you use a light signal to, to communicate between the two. Uh, but GPS clearly shows that the clock frequency at the satellite is integrated into clock time, and clock frequency at the satellite and Doppler frequency at the receiver do indeed cancel each other. But the fact that the clock at the satellite continues to integrate that time makes a very significant difference, and yet we will see many claims that, uh, that it's completely canceled out. Uh, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong one. Uh, GPS, in fact, confirms the clock effects, that uh, gravitational potential uh, will cause a clock to run faster. A clock in, this, in a GPS satellite, for example, at perigee, 
runs slower because it's close to, closer to the Earth, and, in, and be, due to its increased speed, extra kinetic energy, it actually runs even slower. In an amazing fact, they're exactly equal to each other. And a clock on the Earth at the equator. The equator's spinning, so you've got a velocity effect. It's in a gravitational field of the Earth, so you've got a potential effect. And what do they do under that situation? You're farther from the, from the center of the Earth. They exactly cancel each other out so that at sea level, all clocks on the Earth run at the same rate. Well, but they're re described by two different theories. What's going on here? Uh, it, it, it seems uh, like that shouldn't be the right. Incidentally, um, I, I dropped out a bunch of, of, of uh, equations and slides on, on energy. I believe it's in the energy effect is fundamentally what changes the clock. And while I, I will talk about it some, the, I call the clock rate is directly a function of what I call the structural energy. Why do I call it structural energy? Because it goes under the name of rest mass energy normally, but it changes when you're moving. Uh, these two effects that are the same, uh, a, 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 an increase of one direction in, in, uh, in the gravity potential affects the clock one way, and it actually affects it the opposite way. If I stick a clock at a particular height and leave it there, I can look at the gravitational potential and I can say how much was it reduced, et cetera, how fast will the clock run. And, so, and I know it's the, it's the intrinsic energy of that, of that level of potential. When I start it moving, it, it slows down just like it slows down when you lower it in gravitational potential. So a decrease in energy of one and increase in the other. I claim that, that when you move a clock, the structural energy, some of it gets drawn from the, from the structural energy and moved into kinetic energy. What happens? The kinetic energy, there's a hidden component that actually doubles the value. And of course, when you stop with something moving, you recover that. So it's, it's almost invisible. But believe it or not, it shows up in some of the relativity equations, and they didn't know where it came from. I mention that partly because I just became aware uh, from Nick uh, Percival that a person by the name of Viraj Fernando do, just recently described that same effect using the, elect, uh, the, the electrical characteristics of, an, of a moving electron. And in fact, in our this year's paper, he has a paper on page 63 that I highly recommend. He comes to exactly the same conclusions from an entirely different direction. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted to see that, of course. OK, next. I say there's a very severe limitation to the equivalence principle. I, did I hit the wrong way again? No. Uh, yeah, we can, we can lower a clock and raise it back up and see the higher potential. Uh, GPS frequency is not affected as it falls. No path link change effect. Uh, going up a hill changes the clock frequency. I did talk about this already, but, uh, but GPS shows that the clock frequency is, is integrating the satellite time. I'm going to give a, talk a little more about that when I go the right direction here. Uh, there's no, uh, uh, it's clear in GPS that there's no frequency change in transit. How do I know? Well, they adjust the satellite clock ahead of launch for the potential effect and the velocity effect. If, if the satellite changed in frequency, while it's falling, they would have to make a, a, that same change if it weren't due to the clock. But they all, can only correct the clock by a very, I'm sorry, back up. Ah, what am I doing? Keep going. There. OK. Um, and, and, and they can only change it by uh, 0.02 hertz, typically. And now, down at the bottom, it says, if the clock frequency changed in transit rather than the potential effect on the clock, and that was counteracting the lower frequency of transmission, then one orbit later, 11 hours and 56 minutes, the clock error would create a range error of almost exactly 18 kilometers. So it's pretty clear that it's a clock effect and not a falling effect. And uh, in fact, the equivalence principle says over a short period of time, as well as over other limitations. So, there's no question about the fact that the, sa the satellite, the electromagnetic single, falling light, does not change in energy or frequency as it falls. Okay? Now I did it again. Okay. 
Now I want to look at some of the logic of the people that claim it does. Uh, Will, uh, <coughs> Clifford Will in his book, Was Einstein Right? puts the question right. He says, uh, is it at the intrinsic rate of the clock or is it the change in frequency? He says, well, they're both equivalent. Uh, put it differently, there's no operational way to tell the difference. Uh, the observable phenomena is unambiguous. The signal is blue shifted. Uh, and he does even admit you can move it to a higher gravitational potential in the same book. But he says that's after the fact. You still don't really know what happens in real time. To me, that's rather faulty logic. Uh, how about, uh, oh, by the way, I don't think he wants to know, and so I had to put this little cartoon in. The GPS can't find my mom's new address. Maybe it doesn't want to go either. <laughs> what? <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Uh, next one, Ashby and Spilker. I call this one double or nothing and not true. Uh, the first one says, the, the second, the strong equivalence principle implies that light traveling downward in a gravitational field is shifted to a higher frequency, i.e. it's blue shifted and gains energy. As a consequence, atomic clocks at higher elevation in the gravitational field run faster. If I read that right, that he just doubled the effect. Uh, and then the other one, uh, by the equivalence principle, the gravitational effects of the sun are canceled by the free fall of the Earth, and that's just plain not true. Uh, it does get integrated into the GPS uh, clock. Uh, here's what the one I call whichever. The negative sign in this result means that the standard clock in orbit is beating too fast, primarily because its frequency is gravitationally blue shifted. Uh, again, I think he's really talking about falling, but uh, it's not all that clear. And that's in living reviews of relativity in the global positioning system. Uh, and since that's a path effect, I thought this was, con uh, was a a appropriate. Continue to follow the yellow brick road in 30 feet. Continue to follow the yellow brick road in 90 feet. Continue. You can probably turn the blank thing off now, Dorothy. <laughs> and this one I call Feynman's careless derivation. I have to say, here again, kind of aside, I believe I'm really blessed by the fact that I've really got a great critic. He thinks that special relativity and general relativity are correct. And he's been correcting me and correcting me and correcting me. I, I was hoping to have a paper ready for this conference. And at the last minute, he came up and he says, you know, I'd said in an earlier paper, Feynman and Einstein are both wrong. And he said, but Feynman is wrong, all right. But Einstein's not. Read carefully. And I got all upset and started arguing with him. And I said, you, you're not reading the context. And he says, look, I was raised in Germany. I can read the German. <laughs> and lo and behold, after I'd criticized his use of context, he showed me in the context where indeed I misunderstood what Einstein was saying. And I have to, he admitted as well that Einstein had said it pretty poorly, but, uh, but he was right and I had to, had to correct him. But that gave me something else to say on the next slide. In any case, uh, Feynman uh, claims that uh, in fact, uh, just like uh, falling light, uh, when you let uh, lower uh, light in a field, it it, uh, it gains energy, and uh, and he, it's just plain incorrect. I, I did I did play with the equations and rederive what he had carefully, and he made a couple small errors that uh, that he thought were negligible, but that they were second order effect. In fact, they were the primary effect when you use a tiny uh, a tiny change in the energy. So. Uh, I, I think he was a bit careless, or I'm not sure whether he did it on purpose or not even. Uh, I, I would hate to think that that was the case, but, uh, but indeed uh, he is plain wrong. I call this one Einstein's arbitrary potential energy of light. Uh, I was a little bit, uh, as I said, taken aback when I realized I'd misinterpreted him wrong. But then when I realized what he did say, uh, I, I, I believe he got his result because he knew what the answer was he wanted. And I have to admit, I've been guilty of that in that same paper. That's why that guy's had correct me so long. The guy, it's interesting, as all get out, I think he keeps showing me how I can get the result I want, but with his better equations. So, so I'm not too upset with it, but it is embarrassing how often he's had to fix my, uh, my equations. Uh, Einstein arbitrarily defines the light energy equivalent to the mass energy. He assigns the gravitational potential of light as the value that is emitted or absorbed at a ele particular electron transition in an atom at the specific gravitational potential he's at. And by doing that, well, I'll, I'll show you a bit later, the Pound-Rebka or Pound-Snyder experiments, which illustrate 
they had to change the kinetic energy to get it to be absorbed at a lower elevation uh, is in fact exactly uh, because of what, of what Einstein ignored. In effect, by defining the potential energy the way he did, it turns out because the clocks are running at a different rate, it looks like you got some extra energy there. And, and so the guy was arguing, no, he agrees with you. The, the energy is unchanged. The problem was he was measuring the energy differently. He was using the same instrument to measure it, but that instrument is sensitive to its clock rate. So uh, he arbitrarily split the light energy into potential energy and kinetic energy, and it makes it seem to behave like mass energy. But it's not. Uh, I, I drew this picture, and, I, and the blue here, whoops. Uh, is, is the point I want to make. Uh, the, what's the effective light mass after it falls? Feynman said it's greater. GPS says it's the same. What Einstein said was, what he wind up using is the fact that it's M minus one G, minus GH. But he used the fact that the instrument measures it as M to say that it has some extra energy uh, that winds up, uh, which he call, it, uh, ascribes to kinetic energy. And, and, the, and the point I'm trying to, to make in all this is by not accounting for the effect of the clock rate difference upon the measurements, Einstein mislabels the energy as, as, a, as an energy increase rather than the fact that the energy is unchanged. And I believe this leads to all sorts of problems. He was, he was looking for all energy creating a mass-like effect, and it doesn't, and that's a big deal because energy added to mass must of necessity change the gravitational force, inertial mass gravitational mass. Einstein argues that all energy has an equivalent potential energy of EOC squared, and that therefore it acts like mass energy does. It creates curvature, it creates uh, 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 effects on space-time, if you will, and in fact it doesn't. Uh, the, the difference is, and well, we'll get into more of that later, but in other words, he aliases the clock effect into a Doppler-like effect. And I claim that introduces very significant problems into GRT. And let's look at some of that. Here are some energy problems with GRT. The vacuum energy is a small problem here. <laughs> One guy says, OK, if this caused space curvature or something, you wouldn't be able to see anything beyond your nose. Uh, that's a pretty big, huge problem, I think. It has no effect on space-time curvature and no effect on the acceleration of space-time expansion. There's a dark energy problem. Unknown source of energy needed to counteract expected gravitational decrease of acceleration of space-time expansion. I wasn't even aware of this until Unzicker pointed it out. They, 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 they introduced this problem because they think the expansion should slow down. He's saying it's really just staying unchanged because GRT thinks it should slow down. Okay, the observed flatness problem. The huge initial inflation, now I'm not necessarily a, a, a big fan of, of the Big Bang, but they introduced this humongous inflation in order to see that there's no space-time curvature. So again, there's a, there's, they're fighting a problem that wouldn't really be there if Einstein hadn't claimed that all energy acts just like mass energy does. Uh, there's a dark matter problem, and I'll talk more about that. Strange extra kinetic energy at the ex ex edges of galaxies. And that one we have to get a little farther before we can, can go into it. Okay. I like, uh, this one is another slide from previous, uh, the reversal of Einstein's logic. If gravity doesn't affect the energy of electromagnetic radiation... Microphone. Uh, I'm sorry, yep. Yeah. Uh, if gravity doesn't, does not affect the energy of electromagnetic radiation, this contradicts GRT, but it solves those first three energy problems. Uh, the entire energy of a falling mass, if you convert it into light, beam it upward, and then reconvert it into mass, will claim, will say that mass doesn't change energy in a gravity field either, which can be a little bit startling. Uh, and that's where I claim that means that the structural energy changes as it falls, as it picks up speed the actual, it's not rest mass energy, but the structural energy has to change in order to keep the energy equal. But I don't see any escape from that conclusion if I reverse their logic and take the entire energy, not just the fact that I lowered it, but the fact that it's gained kinetic energy as well. 
So what that says is that the kinetic energy in a gravitational field comes entirely from converting rest structural mass energy into kinetic, and if you stick it back up, the conversion goes the opposite way. Quite an interesting thing, I think. Um, <clears throat> okay, now I'm doing kind of intermission. Uh, over the years, I've had various uh, ether models. In my book, 1992 book, I called it an ether gauge theory. Uh, later on in uh, Galilean Electrodynamics and Physics Essays, I called it a modify, modified Lorentzian ether theory. Uh, this was just suggested to me recently, my older brother, he's helped me a lot in a lot of different ways. Uh, he suggested that I call it Tesla for the elastic solid Lorentzian ether. I like that partly because I think it was uh, David that sent me a, sent out a couple quotes from Tesla and I thought, hey, that fits. Uh, kind of neat. Uh, uh, and and it, it's a nicer name. It tells you everything you want to know about it. Uh, elastic, solid, Lorentzian ether. Okay, what about it? In that book, way back when, the first thing I tried to face up to was why isn't there why is there only a, 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 a transverse wave? Why isn't there longitudinal waves like there are in most pressure substances? And I finally realized that if I would pick the spot where sigma Poisson's ratio is exactly zero, that I would have an effect that was kind of nice. What that says is that if you stretch it in one way, it has no interaction with the other dimension. And that's kind of neat in the following sense, because then I could do a couple of constructions. I could take and make a wave in the ether in which standing wave that had shear only, similar to a magnetic, which I ascribe to a magnetic field, and a standing wave of contraction expansion, which I say is similar to an electric field, and then a combined version of that uh, can give me a particle in which I get, uh, get uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some, what do I want to say, uh, resonance effects that will cause it not to move. And then if I go on, I can get some moving ether waves as well, in which the, the, the shear and the compression work together, kind of like a caterpillar, to make it move. Now, caterpillars move pretty slow, but this is such a hard substance, it moves rather fast, even when it acts kind of like a caterpillar. And uh, I think, uh, now the next thing I did in the book, and I wanted to do it here, was, was describe my model of, uh, of an electron. And it fundamentally was a kind of like a rounded off cube in which the opposite faces span in the same, spun in the same direction and they had a, a double wave in inside each face and they wound up uh, at the pole, two, two spin poles, oscillating plus and minus at the equator actually having a real spin as, as they added, all added together and the, and the upper pole and the lower pole were completely opposite to each other. That gave some really neat magnetic effects that looked like it matched the electron. And my brother, when he simulated it in real time, found out that it was only stable when it's moving in two orientations, one along the velocity and one against, kind of like spin up and spin down. So I rather like that, and I think it may be somewhat realistic, at least. I, I say that, and now I'm going to move on immediately. Uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably claiming too much here, but uh, there are a number of things that this fits rather well. It has fairly simple mathematics. It, it's easy to, to take the results. Uh, it's better unification. I'm going to try to prove some of these things, incidentally, a, a little bit later on. It resolves anomalous data without adding patches. Uh, restoration of absolute simultaneity is, I think, a, a pretty, pretty big thing. And let's go on. Uh, Tesla and relativity. The ether approach shows the physics that cause an apparent constancy in the speed of light, an apparent equivalency in the physics of inertial frames, and extends the results to gravitational frames, of all things, and it reveals that universal now. In terms of general relativity, uh, it gets rid of space-time curvature. It re is replaced by an ether density gradient, uh, which is easy to understand, but rather remarkably similar when you start looking at the mathematics involved. And one more, Tesla and quantum theory and general <coughs> point particles are replaced by standing wave structures. No wave particle duality. Particles are waves, kind of opposite of some of what you've heard. And, and so, yeah, I expect a little bit of criticism here, feedback. Uh, 
The, you're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might. I thought that. <laughs> The quantum effects are the result of the resonant structures interacting with the zero-point radiation, I believe. And uh, I believe it was Ives that said the quantum effects occur in the vestibule of the atom. In other words, it's not in the transmission at all. It's that's the way it, the orbits in the atom are quantized, so they can only absorb quantum of energy. Uh, and I like that argument. So I really don't believe in photons, but I don't advertise that very much. Why stir up controversy when you don't have to? <laughs> okay. Uh, the standing wave displays an internal ether, and it takes the speed of light to react to that, and so there's less ether density internally as a function of C, incidentally. And the spin tends to be two-dimensional, so it's kind of like C squared, maybe. Um, that internal ether displacement is directly related to the particle's energy and mass. The external ether density gradient is, in fact, the gravitational field and, and what causes it. I like this Wikipedia con, uh, uh, comment that my brother pulled out for me. According to modern understanding, the electron is a point particle with a point charge and no spatial extent. Attempts to model the electron as a non-point particle are considered ill-conceived and counter-pedagogic. <laughs> Whatever that <means. laughs> Okay. Uh, Tesla and gravitational potential scaling. Uh, I'll go into this a bit more, but there's a scale factor. In fact, there's one given by Einstein, and there's another one that I like a little bit better. But uh, the scale factor gets bigger. S approaches 1 uh, as you go up in the gravitational field, gravitational potential. Clock time intervals are shorter. That means the frequency is increased, and your clock time intervals are the opposite. Uh, namely directly dependent on it. Length distances are increased. Mass is decreased by the cube, incidentally. The speed of light is increased as the square. Uh, mass is decreased, yeah, okay. The mass energy is increased, mc squared. When you combine those up, upper two, you get one dependence of s directly. The gravitational, this is one you might find interesting. Gravitational constant is increased by the eighth power. I think that's partly why JPL has to solve for the gravitational potential in effect whenever they put a new satellite up and want to know what, uh, what it is. In other words, it's strongly dependent on the gravitational potential itself. Uh, the gravitational force is, tends to be unchanged unless I put this mass dependence of S in there and then it'll come back in. Okay. Uh, a little bit more detail on that. Shapiro experiment, rate of time delay as Venus passes the sun, shows that the speed of light changes as a square. Incidentally, the Harvard experiments, Pound, Ripke, et cetera, also show the same thing when you look at it uh, carefully. Uh, clock effects are local time intervals changed by the inverse of S. Therefore, links must change proportional to S to get that squared uh, dependence of light. Since gravitational potential energy changes proportional to S, the structural energy changes by s, namely mc squared s. Therefore, mass must change as the inverse of s with, when you combine that with what c is to the third power, which is kind of interesting. OK. Here is some gravitational force implications. Uh, I, I give you Einstein's scale factor there. Uh, and you see, in fact, its first two parent terms are identical with the one I think is right. This is called the isotropic scale factor, or the po parameterized post-Newtonian form that's used in some of, uh, of uh, Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler's gravitational thing. And it's often treated as if it's the same, but it's not. It differs out there in the second digit. This fits my idea of what the ether does, namely an ether pressure would decrease as exponential. So this I was delighted to see that they were already using in some cases. Now, if I call the potential energy of, of a particle in a gravitational field as mc squared s, namely that dependence, and now I take the gradient of that potential, in other words, if I have a force and I move it, I get energy. So if I have energy and I take the gradient of it, I should be able to get the force, right? And indeed, I get a gravitational force that looks rather amazing. Namely, when I use the exponential form, I get that S back in the numerator, saying that there's a slight decrease that's unaccounted for in the gravitational force. And incidentally, there's quite a bit of evidence that ARP shows that that's happening at fairly close distances. I think it's the blue light that uh, 
that uh, seems to have a lot more gravitational shift than it should have. Uh, incidentally, if you use Einstein's, uh, you get a bit different. You find out that S goes in the denominator, which says by the time you get down to black hole size, you've got infinite gravitational force. Kind of, kind of hard to believe when you're losing energy in the particle that's being acted upon. So um, uh, Einstein's form would give a black hole theoretically, and uh, so I don't believe in black holes. Horrors! They just had a measurement from one of them. Uh, incidentally, uh, it's kind of off track again. Uh, I uh, I looked at my model of that ether and uh, electric and magnetic effects really are kind of like oscillating gravity and oscillating shear effects or uh, the way that the current physicists call it is gravi gravitomagnetic effects. I like to just call it kinetic effect because movement causes shear and an oscillating shear looks like a magnetic field. So, uh, so I was arguing they'd never see a black hole because uh, the uh, they were looking for the wrong thing. They were looking gravitational ways instead of electromagnetic. Well, when they saw something, one of my, one of the people that was knowing I was predicting they, pre predicting they probably wouldn't see anything, said, did you notice just before they started that one of the principals was down there and he saw that they were seeing all kinds of electromagnetic effects. And he says, don't run the experiment until we shield it. And they said, no, it's too late. We, we've got to go ahead with it. So I believe what they were seeing was an electromagnetic effect, mm -hmm. probably from some severely dense mass, indeed circulating, circulating. But incidentally, that model of mass decreasing says that there is some hidden mass automatically there. And uh, we'll get to a little bit more about that later. OK, dark matter versus mom. Milgram, and I think it's been mentioned several times already uh, in the last several days, <clears throat> Milgram postulates a modified minimum acceleration of gravitational masses called uh, uh, modified Newtonian dynamics. Of a, at about 10 to the minus 8 centimeters per second, it stops getting weaker at the edges of galaxies and tends to stay at that same value. Uh, <clears throat> his ad hoc model fits the experimental data of galaxy rotation significantly better than dark matter which have to be customized pretty much for each galaxy. <clears throat> uh, now, no rational mechanism has been found that gives a good explanation for this. There are a number of postulates or people trying to guess at various things. <clears throat> and in addition, he admits that there is some, apparently even after he gets this best fit, there's often something on the order of maybe 10 to 20% of extra dark matter or something creating an extra force. Thank you. I do need that. So there are, are there are some interesting things here. So I give a few slides here, what I call towards a mon mechanism. I'm not claiming this is it, but I think it looked kind of intriguing. Uh, my assumption is the gravitational force is actually the interaction of the energy of the source and energy of particles acted upon. Uh, and that requires a redefined gravitational constant. I call that G over C fourth, which eliminates that dependence on S. The scale factor S is a measure of the fractional ether density change from the background level, if you will, and it's induced by the gravitational source energy. And I give the value of S. I should also give that first order ex uh, expansion. That's almost exactly for the small values that you normally encounter, it's one minus that. So the, the de deviation from one is just that exponential value, which you get from small exponential uh, expansions. <clears throat> the energy of the mass acted upon is given by E equal mc squared s. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Second assumption, the expansion of the universe creates a lower ether density. Now this is something a little bit new, uh, whose rate of decrease is defined by Hubble's constant. They, they don't recognize that this is an ether effect at all. Uh, and its uh, rate of change uh, turns out to be around two. Uh, it's, it's a little bit hard. Hubble is kind of fuzzy, but somewhere around two times 10 to the minus 18th per second. Now, I say the gradient of the mass energy when acted on like this, I call that g over c to the fourth g prime, is mc squared over r and mc squared s over r. 
and I say the blue uh, source uh, energy is really the density of the ether where it is exi exists, and the same is true of the red. It's where it exists. Um, but my assumption is that the lower ether density and pressure due to Hubble expansion will take some time to propagate inward at C to adjust that ether density gradient. In other words, I don't see any reason it wouldn't if it's an external decrease. And if you multiply those two together, you get C times H, which is 6 times 10 to the minus 8. Now, I don't know where they got the fudge factor, but they divide that by 2 pi, just so it comes out about the same. Uh, so it's observed to be somewhere around 1.2 times 10 to the minus 8, uh, plus or minus 0.2, I think, is the number they give. And I'm saying uh, there could several be, be several differences. I say my effect, my guess is that effect appears lower due to the addition at all ranges, but I also think it may arise, for example, from the fact that it gets up to be a bigger and bigger effect as you get to the more and more dense ether near the source. And it's got to be some kind of steady state distribution. So I think that may explain a little bit why the lower bend point than uh, this would predict. But again, this is rather speculative, but I think it's an interesting thing to look at in terms of explaining that extra force out at the edges. <clears throat> okay, another break. Generation of transformations between a parent frame and a child frame. Now I want to turn to SRT for a while. And, uh, and I say this uh, is not, uh, uh, not SRT, it's not symmetrical. And that's the difference uh, that I'm going to describe. Einstein and symmetry. He says, by the special theory of relativity, the same equations without any change of meaning also hold in relation to any new system of coordinates, k prime, which is moving in uniform translation relative to k. For the theoretician, such an asymmetry in the theoretical structure with no con corresponding asymmetry in the system of any experience is intolerable. If we assume the ether to be at rest relative to k, but motion relative to k prime, the physical equivalence of k and k prime seems to me, from a logical standpoint, if not indeed downright incorrect, nevertheless unacceptable. And I claim that uh, that argument is invalid, that there is actually is some anti -symmetry. All receivers are synchronized to the same clock. Yeah. That whatever clock's frequencies are, are, are there, they shouldn't matter at all. Uh, the, the, ground, the, the receiver clocks are synchronized only in the sense that they solve for the time on the basis of the measurements they receive. Yeah, 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 okay, but, but, but the satellites, the, the vehicles they, are synchronized. Yeah, within limits, be oh, careful. Yeah. You know, they, okay. there is clock errors that you have to either solve for by measuring or correct on an orbit by orbit basis. Okay, just that one small yeah. comment. That figure of the uh, acceleration, uh, that kind of, uh, what was that? Uh, 1.2, 10 to minus 8 centimeters. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, th th that uh, amount? Uh, That's the Mond amount where they see at the edges of the galaxy yeah. there's that extra acceleration. And, and that uh, looks uh, very close to the Pioneer anomaly, right? Yeah, exactly. And they get yeah, the, the yeah. same direction. Do you have any comments? I, I, I wrote a paper on the Pioneer effect. I still think that, that I have a better explanation than their therm thermal. Why do I think that? because I could also explain this great big cyclical effect that they ignored as the residuals. And the paper I wrote is in physics essays. I showed that with the expansion of the universe, you would get an effect on the frequency, but you wouldn't get an effect on the range. But they weren't measuring the range directly. They were only looking at the frequency. So I think my explanation was better purely because I could see the Earth's orbit effect in the effect, which the farther away it gets, the smaller it gets. And it fit their decreasing pattern almost perfectly. They blamed that effect on the fact that they didn't have quite the right direction or some such effect. And, and that effect uh, in, the, in the mode theory, what would be the nature of it? I mean, the, the nature it be, of it is the time, is, is because the, of, of the uh, Hubble expansion, by the time you get out there in a one way, the clock at that thing has decreased. Now, actually, they send it back, so it's the round trip time. Your clock has changed because of the expansion in the meantime, and it fits it virtually perfectly. I was watching your presentation, and you were talking about the equivalence principle. Yeah, yeah. And I had given the argument in my talk that 
uh, relativity was incomplete because it did not take into account radiation and radiation reaction. If you take into account radiation and radiation reaction, the acceleration and the force and the acceleration and gravity are not equivalent because acceleration produces radiation and recoil, but gravity doesn't. My, my first argument against the guy that argued, for example, that uh, it completely cancels out gravity, and that's in the GPS Bible, if you will, the big blue book, Parkinson and et al., two volumes. Uh, Ashby claims, well, it canceled out because the Earth's falling. But all you have to do is take a look at the micro, uh, the millisecond pulsars, and it shows up loud and clear. Uh, there's a difference in the clocks, and the, there's a difference on the clocks on the Earth. Uh, in fact, to Charles M. Hill, uh, the, the guy that incidentally caused me to stop selling my book because he showed me I had a mistake, uh, namely aberration. In fact, uh, 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 Bob, you'll appreciate this. He told me that the uh, that the uh, that I couldn't explain the uh, aberration effect. Uh, I blamed it on the gravity field carrying the light with it, kind of like kind of like Peter Beckman, except Beckman I think called it caused it the potential. And I said that wouldn't do it because potential of the sun is bigger at the Earth than the Earth. So I said it'd have to be a gravitational field, and, and I. And, I, and he said, that, yeah, that can't explain the aberration. And he said, also, if you look at the equator and you've got a difference in okay. clock time, then it has to recover somewhere. And I thought, well, I can prove that. I spent three months trying to show that I could explain it. And no matter what I did, I got negative uh, aberration, kind of like you showed. Yeah. If, if, you're, if your light's entering something that's moving, it gets carried along with it, and you get negative aberration. So I had to change my whole theory. Fortunately, at that time, all it meant was just get, stop selling the book. So, so now you can buy the book at a very high price, I understand, while I will normally give it away free if you want it. But I'm getting bugged by a lot of people to fix the parts of it that I now disagree with. So you can't win. <laughs> uh, I agree uh, with uh, a lot of things on uh, uh, what you say until you said the universe is expanding. Yeah, so uh, you and the Big Bang will be the same. I, I don't necessarily be the Big Bang, but if, the, if, if we really do have an ether under pressure, why wouldn't it expand? In fact, I've, I've had some interesting discussions with people that believe a young Earth, which I'm very skeptical of, frankly, and yet there are a lot of people that believe it. And I've, I have said, hey, there is one way I can imagine this, if, if, if we were in a real dense blob to begin with, and now it's expanding out, it's going to expand out a lot faster on the edges. That's going to create a gravitational force inward, so all of these planets and stars could be falling inward and counteracting some of the other stuff. And I don't know, it's theoretically possible, but I, I'm not... It's kind of fun to play with, but at this point, I wouldn't uh, yeah, put much I, I, I agree with you with that young Earth, that, that young Earth stuff is a bunch of baloney. The problem is, uh, if the uh, ex uh, universe is expanding, yep. you must have a point of, uh, for the initiation of the, the universe. And, yeah, and, 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 and amazingly, when, uh, again, some of the young Earth people like to point out some of this stuff, amazing when you look at the star's pattern, it's centered around a, a spot that's not all that far away, and in fact there is blue light shift instead of red in that one direction kind of amazing, and in fact, there are kind of rings around that point of extra stars, almost like there was a burst at some point, and it had extra density at those points. So again, I don't buy the overall hypothesis, but there's some pretty good evidence that there was a point, a point yeah, explosion. The, the, the problem is, if, if uh, the stop as uh, yep. some yep. Yep. time and uh, space dimension must be also created Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Outside, that, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that nothing. Right, but but you but no one will no one will argue with you that the vacuum of our space has some clear physical properties. So what's outside? Maybe there really is something like a real vacuum that we're expanding into. That would be my hypothesis. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Ron, on that, I had a question that you almost mentioned in passing on Shapiro time delay, the, the way I would understand that is the uh, light in the vicinity of the sun there hits the clocks are running slow, but then you're also measuring it 
with a smaller clock on the other end, but you threw in length contraction. It seems like that would be a third effect. I, I don't know where the length contraction occurred into that. Yeah, the, the, the length contraction, if, if you will, the speed of light is changing as the square. But the frequency energy is remaining unchanged. That means that my wavelength has to be changing at twice the rate. Now, locally, it doesn't. So, for example, when I do the uh, pound Repka experiment, I do measure a difference in the wavelengths, which makes it look like there's been a, uh, a frequency change. But it's not real. It's because of that double action of the, of the wavelength. Could you uh, comment on the uh, GRACE experiment that uh, I'm sorry, the GRACE on which one again? The GRACE satellites. That, uh, oh, yes. Uh, the GRACE satellites are kind of interesting. And in fact, I was asked by some people at JPL if I could help explain the fact that they're measuring a 6.25 picosecond bias in some of their measurements when they were measuring one way. I asked them to turn the experiment around and measure the other way. They never did measure that other direction. So I couldn't really get a, as good a handle on it as I would like to. And the other thing, clearly in that experiment, if you look at what they're measuring, you're measuring C minus V and C plus V between the satellites. How do they get around that? They simply measure the two-way path and report on that. And as we all know, the two-way path, if you account for the shortening, satisfies that problem. I'll talk down. It's kind of late, right? <laughs> okay, is that it? Okay, thank you very much. Go. All right, uh, thank you very much for a great talk. And uh, right now, before everybody uh, heads off on this Friday, we'd like to present a, a award to Ron. Again, we've been presenting awards, I think, since 2008. Uh, and even though the name of the the award has changed and the name of the organization, the people certainly haven't. The 98, 95, 90% of the people who have made up our organization before. We just simply have a new name and I think a better name, uh, named after John Chappelle. There's no doubt uh, of who this is about. And we decided to simply use the name of the society and, and give a lifetime award an achievement. And we'd like to do this to people in, uh, do this to people, yeah. Do this uh, and show our appreciation in this, in this organization, but also in the dissident world, because it's so, I think the hardest thing is the frustration to see such amazing work. Something that probably 100 years from now, people will look at us the same way they look at Newton and say, look at these amazing people, and boy, that must have been a great time. It's not so easy. And uh, I think the most important thing for us is when we recognize, you know, really good work. And I know that you've been working on your own theory, but more than that, you've been going at GPS and relativity and really questioning. Instead of just simply doing your job and getting your patents and, and uh, being successful business-wise, you're looking at the cur your curious mind looks at, well, why is this happening? And, What's behind this? And you have a, um, something that everybody in this group has, which is, I don't know what exactly it is. We try to pinpoint it. But there are some of us who will look for truth no matter what. And that's not easy. That happens in a lot of disciplines. And there's very few people. The good thing is, is that we have this group to recognize that. One of the things I've heard a number of times, and, I, and people here, and myself as well, don't realize it. When I was writing the book with my father, well, we wrote all the stuff and we were putting everything in. I was writing the book for you guys, but not the general public, because the things that we know and talk about are natural to us. We, we, we automatically know what an ether is and what, a, what that means. We automatically know why are we even challenging these things? We, we all understand and have, have thought, oh yeah, the Big Bang has problems, general relativity problems, plate tectonics has problems. But we often forget the rest of the world doesn't speak that language. But when we come here, the great thing about it is, is you don't have to spend all the time telling people, okay, let's get to where we are trying to speak. Because you waste a lot of time. And I had to go back in the book and put in a section, okay, if you are a, you know, a mainstream person, 
oh, let me tell you, there are problems. Or if you're, if you're a person who likes science, they like our model because it's an easy model to deal with. They, how, there's, things are wrong? And so when you get here, you bypass all that stuff. And then when you bypass all that stuff, you get to talk with the people around you. And you have an incredible interaction because you're not having to bring hold a person's hand to try to get them to understand. One person came up to me and literally said at one conference, says, David, I talk, this is the first conference, I talk to these people and they understand me. <laughs> and uh, besides that, once we've been together so long, then you start to see people who have been here and who have really influenced. And one of the things I always talk about is Ron Hatch and his work with GPS. Why? It's a real thing. There's something that's really hard to do, and that is to argue with a person who has 30, over 30 patents in GPS about how light works and transmission of light and, and, and all of that. Because people are gonna say, wait a minute, you know, He's in the real world looking at this. So I thought it was very appropriate to, to have uh, us, and I talked very much over with Greg. Greg Volk has uh, been very busy in the last few years. He's had to take a break because he's uh, on uh, dissident science overload. And uh, there was no question here. So we're really, really proud to, to give you this award. In fact, uh, I really like, uh, it's our first time we've actually done it this way, but. Um, I've got my glasses icon, I see this. It's quite a handsome award here, and uh, it states, it says, the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society bestows upon Ron Hatch its highest honor of love, lifetime achievement award. Holder of over 30 patents in the field of global positioning systems, GPS, for a lifetime of pioneering work in the area of GPS and how it il illustrates flaws in the Einstein special th in Einstein's special theory of relativity and of course general relativity. And it says, awarded on this day, July 22nd, 2016, signed by myself and the secretary, uh, 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 Nick Percival. So we, we proudly present this with you. To you. I get all emotional, but I'm going to hand this over to him. Hopefully he's okay to speak. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm not only honored, but humbled by it. I appreciate it very much. And I think you'll think this is funny. After I heard you talk about expansion of the Earth, I realized, you know, this. In, I did a little computation. In three quarters of a billion years, three, two thirds of a billion years, the linear expansion that I mentioned with uh, Hubble would cause a 4% change in the radius, but on the surface, which is 4 pi r squared, the 4 pi says it's 25 times bigger, or in two-thirds of, of a billion years, I would create twice the surface area on the surface of the Earth. Kind of interesting. I had never thought of any... Everything else seems to be one-to-one. -one. You can't tell any difference between the expansion and the non-expansion because the, the, uh, the fundamental measurements are identical. But then, uh, hey, surface of the Earth, maybe, maybe not. Okay. Well, congratulations. Congratulations. We're going to take some photos now. We're going to go outside. Um, and he's going to stand there. If anybody wants to get a photo with him, they can. Uh, we have uh, our photo area out there. Um, we're going to take some pictures, Tom. Maybe we can do. You can help me out with that. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, if you want to come up and congratulate, we're going to go outside. So you can go out there. We'll uh, take some photos.